Imagine building a plane from scratch, only to be betrayed by your airline customer, go bankrupt, and have to destroy the prototype weeks before your first flight. This is the biggest what if in regional aviation, the story of the Fairchild Dornier 728. You see, the regional jet market is a vicious place, and back in the early 2000s, many firms were competing to be the equivalent of the 737 of the sub 100 seater market. In one corner was the Canadian Bombardier with their CRJ program, and in the south, Brazil's Embraer with its ERJ and E-Jet series. But today's video is about that one underdog firm smack bang in the middle of that market that wanted to rise up and take it all, Fairchild Donia, with a complete new family of aircraft, the 728 series. This plane would have filled the entire 50 to 130 seater market, beaten the Airbus A220 to the market, and taken the rival Embraer head on. In today's video, we'll see what the 728 was like, which airline betrayed the builders, and ultimately, why it was never built. Let's explore. Hey, it's me, Nick here from Found and Explained. If you like today's video, be sure to subscribe. The story of the Fairchild Donia 728 doesn't start with Fairchild at all. In fact, it starts with another plane entirely, the turboprop-ed Donia 328. This twin turboprop-ed aircraft was not considered a bad plane, but, but just not that exciting. It was originally created as a modern answer to the 30-seater market in Europe and was considered the most advantageous turboprop of the early 90s. Thanks to its high altitude and cruise speed, it was just as efficient as jet engines and burned significantly less fuel. It was perfectly suited for point-to-point -point regional travel and marketed across Europe and to Western USA. And by 1991, it had secured a huge order with Horizon Air for 35 aircraft, the biggest that year for any turboprop of that caliber. So why exactly did I say it wasn't exciting? Well, in the early 90s, the latest hot thing was a regional jet, not a regional turboprop. That, plus a crowded turboprop market with many more seats, pushed the company to lose a ton of money. How much exactly? Well, they lost 337 million in 1995 alone. So what was the solution to their problem? How could they make their superior turboprop sexy? By slapping some turbojets on it. This new version would be called the imaginative title of the 328 jet, and it would be faster than any other regional jet of that caliber and outperform even the turboprop. And because Donair had completely over-engineered their original turbojet plane, very little design work had to be performed to the original turboprop model. They put engines on the prototype and were able to start selling it right away. At the same time enters our hero of the story, Fairchild Aircraft. This American firm had created the A-10 Warthog and had huge success in its Gulf War with its signature sound. The firm acquired the lagging Dornier and its 328 jet program with some ambitious ideas indeed. After all, why focus on just the 30-seater market when airlines really wanted a 100-seater profit machine? This is what they came up with. The 728 series would take with what worked with the 328 jet program and improve on it dramatically. The new family of regional jets, called the 528 jet, the 728 jet and the 928 jet, would seat 55 to 100 passengers and was launched at the Berlin Aerospace Air Show in 1998. The 728 model would be the first on the market. Officially, the 728-100 was to have a passenger capacity of 70 to 85 seats. The 728 would have the largest cabin in its class, being 0.51 meters wider than the Embraer and 70 centimeters wider than the CRJ-700 with five abreast seating. Now, interestingly, this is where that five-seating arrangement came in at the request of Lufthansa, who was interested 
in the aircraft. You see, they didn't want a low-cost carrier to come in with the same plane, slap in six seats, and beat them in their own market. Which, you'll see later, is one of the choices that contributed to the downfall of the type. Needless to say, a Fairchild Donner would actually go on to shrink the width of their plane design to accommodate the request from Lufthansa. After the Dash 100, there would be a Dash 200 series that, thanks to more powerful different engines, would have a 400 nautical mile increase in range. But why stop there? Why not stretch out the 728 further into the 928? The 928 had a stretch fuselage that would have enabled the aircraft to achieve a passenger capacity of 95 to 110 seats. The 928 featured an increased wingspan and more powerful engines, and plus, a Dash 200 version was planned with better engines that would give it a range of 1,925 nautical miles. Lastly, the team also proposed a shrink of the 728 to the 528 to bridge a gap between the currently under development 328. The 528 was to have a shortened fuselage and a passenger capacity of 55 to 65 seats to a range of 1,600 nautical miles. But that's not all. But wait! There's more! There were also tentative plans at the organizations, once they had dominated this sub 100 seater market, to move up to a second stretch called the 1128, seating up to 120 passengers and biting the lower end of the Boeing 737 market. There was also a business jet version called the Envoy 7 that could fly from Europe to the USA without refueling. Lastly, Fairchild Dornier shopped the aircraft around the military as an early warning aircraft and apparently an air tanker for mid-air refueling. And this plan was a big success. By June 2001, it was reported that leasing firm GCAS placed an order for 50 aircraft as well as options for 100 more. By early 2002, the total of 8 customers, including Lufthansa, had placed a cumulative 125 firm orders for the type, as well as signed options for an additional 164 aircraft, which was almost the 200 needed for the program to make a profit. So, what the hell happened to this impressive lineup and all these orders? Flash forward to March 2002 and only two days before the 728 would taxi around the airport for the first time under its own power, the firm revealed that the program would have to be paused for two months as it found additional funds. But that extra money would never come and by April the very same year, the aerospace builder had to file for bankruptcy. Instead of their miracle plane taking to the skies, the company would be flying into the ground. In a follow-up huge blow to the firm as they were trying to find additional capital, both Lufthansa and the air leasing firm Geekas pulled out, making the program far from profitable. Low-cost carriers who had been interested at the time also pulled out, as the cabin could no longer be reconfigurable for high-density seating. The engineers trying to unsuccessfully sell the program onwards and by 2004 had to give up everything entirely, including the three prototype aircraft that had never flown, but for all intents and purposes were ready to take off. In the end, the three prototypes were scrapped or used for other engineering purposes, but not for their maiden missions of flying passengers, but rather serving as a warning to everybody else willing to try and enter the regional market. If these planes had flown and been successful in the market, you could have imagined that this firm would have gone on to dominate the regional space, pushing out the Airbus A220 and perhaps even biting at Airbus and Boeing. Due to its close relationship with DASA, one of the firms that worked with Airbus, it is possible that we could have actually seen this company be bought into the Airbus family and become part of the greater international network. Or, in my mind, they would have struck out on their own and created their own small jet taking on the world. Thanks for watching today's video on this topic. We now have a Discord that you can join below, and for those who are looking to support the channel, we also have a Patreon. Found and explained Patreons are boarding now. Calling Scott Lothar, Troy Tempest, David Grisblack, Lauren Un, and Weir. Thank you so much for your support, and be sure to buckle up and see you in the next video.